Opponent. This may be proper if anybody can have this realization thus. As a matter of fact, however, the idea that one is subject to sorrowfulness, etc., is strong, so that nobody can realize the absence of sorrowfulness, etc. Vedantin. No, since the reasonable position is that the self-identification with misery, etc., is as unreal as the self-identification with the body, etc. For it is a matter of direct experience that when the body is cut or burned, one has such false identification as, I am being cut, I am being burnt. Similarly, it is seen that when more external objects like sons and friends suffer, one superimposes this suffering on oneself by saying, I am suffering. The self-identification with misery, etc., must be similar, since, like the body, etc., miserableness, etc., are perceived to be separate from consciousness. Besides, this does not persist in deep sleep, etc., whereas consciousness is present even in sleep, as stated in that it does not see in that state is because, although seeing then, it does not see. Riharananyaka 4.3.23 Hence, the realization of the self means the realization that I am the self which is one and is characterized as consciousness and freedom from all sorrow. A man who realizes the self thus can have no other duty. Thus it is that the Upanishadic text shows the absence of any duty for a knower of the self in What shall we achieve through children, we who have attained this self, this result? Brihararanyaka 4.4.22 The Smriti also says, But the man who is devoted to the self and is satisfied with the self and content in the self alone has no obligatory duty. Gita 3.17. But to one to whom this realization does not come promptly, this very repetition is meant for bringing about the realization. Even there, however, the teacher should not distract him from the understanding of the sentence, that thou art, in order to direct him to mere repetition. For nobody marries his daughter to a bridegroom for killing him. So long as a man acts under direction, he must have such ideas opposed to the ideas of Brahman as, I am qualified for this, I am the agent of action, and I have to do this. For the man who is dull of intellect and discards the meaning of a sentence just because it is not obvious to him, it is admitted that his mind has to be fixed on the meaning of that sentence through the process of repetition, etc., as stated above. Hence, even in the case of the knowledge of the Supreme Brahman, a repetition of the instructions leading to that knowledge is necessary. Namaste. So, this Adhikarana, the second Adhikarana of the first pada of the fourth chapter of Brahma Sutra, is giving the key to getting the result of Vedanta practice. That is, moksha. And the key is one must practice repetitively. It's as simple as that. For example, when one practices a mantra, he says the same phrase over and over again, isn't it? Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya. With each repetition, the false ideas, the wrong ideas about the object of the mantra are dissipated, eroded, washed away, 
by the sound current until at last only the core concept is left. And that is that, in the case of Om Namah Shivaya, that Shiva, being the reflection of Brahman in Maya, Ishwara, the controller, should be worshipped, should be adored. And if we do this, we find that we are making advancement in life although there's no apparent reason for it, the mechanism remains obscure because it is the will of God. And God is subtle. God is not immediately apparent or visible. Yet, when we direct our attention toward God in any form, God responds. And how does he respond, or she, <laughs> whether we worship Shiva or Shakti, whether we worship Nirguna Brahman or Saguna Brahman, the result is pretty much the same. That our life slowly becomes purified of all suffering, all miserableness, as he uses the word in the purport. Uh, all sorrowfulness, it leads to the end of sorrow. And what is that? It's identical with the end of desire. If one desires nothing but the Supreme, Brahman or God or Shiva or whatever you want to call it, Tao or, you know, whatever it is that is the basis and the origin of everything, then our life is free from sorrow, free from suffering, free from error and misunderstanding. Because the root of all these things, suffering and so on, is that we desire we want something that's not there, isn't it? We put it off in the future. So now we have to have a future. We're committed to a future. We're going to continue to exist so that we can have this thing, whatever it is we desire. And that is actually the origin of the samsara, the round of birth and death. Because at the end of the life, whatever you desired but did not attain becomes the seed, the root, the sprout of the next life, the next body and mind. And then in that existence, one remembers that desire, whether consciously or not, doesn't matter, but it becomes the formation of the next body and mind. And so these desires continue from lifetime to lifetime because the subtle body is not destroyed at the time of death, only the gross body. So the memories and the experiences of this life, the mood, the desires, everything is compressed into an archive like a zip file that the mind takes to the next body. And it actually bases the next body on those desires. So if we have a desire for heaven, we can attain heaven. But that doesn't release us from birth and death. If we want material things, we'll come into the next life with a desire for more material things and so on and so forth. All the desires for wealth, power, fame, beauty, knowledge, even renunciation, huh? to be a big sannyasi or a big sadhu, lead to rebirth, either in an extension of this life or in a new life, in a new body. 
So the secret to attaining Brahman, timelessness, and freedom from suffering is freedom from desire. And we've covered these topics, I mean, innumerable times in our previous video, that this material world is always unsatisfactory. So even when we get the things we desire, they don't satisfy us. We want more or better or, you know, something. <laughs> it's always something, isn't it? The things that we attain are imperfect. They don't really satisfy our desires. They leave us wanting more. And that more leads to another life and another life. And it only ends when we give up these desires and realize we already are everything that we could ever want. We are that pure, perfect Brahman, limitless, huh? pure consciousness, with all desires satisfied. Because whatever Brahman might desire, immediately manifests. So this is the uh, origin of the myths of the uh, Neo-Advaitans that, you know, okay, you're Brahman, you're everything, you're God, so you can have whatever you want. It's okay. But Brahman's desires don't have to do with things. Brahman does not want a new car or you know, a better boyfriend or girlfriend or, you know, a better drug or whatever. Brahman wants self-satisfaction. Because Brahman knows all these external things are simply maya. They don't really exist. Because they don't exist, how can they give satisfaction? They're only dreams. Thoughts in the mind. And this is proved when you realize Brahman. How do you realize Brahman? Perform the sadhanas. Now the sadhanas were detailed in the third chapter of Brahma Sutra. So why does he continue to talk about it in the fourth chapter, which deals with the results? Because he wants to drive home this point right in the beginning that without repeated attempts, one will not realize Brahman. At one time, I was on an extended retreat on the Hawaiian island of Kauai, camped out in a beautiful beach, uh, a forest near the beach. And Every day I was chanting my mantra at least a hundred thousand times. That was my sadhana. So I was talking with one young fellow there and telling him what I was doing. And he said, oh yeah, I tried that. I chanted for 15 minutes and nothing happened. <laughs> See, this is, whether he realizes it or not, the neo Advaita viewpoint. Well, I tried that and it didn't work, so I dropped it. Sadhana has to be repeated, not once, not 10 times, not a thousand times, but millions of times until we remove all the wrong ideas and come to the correct realization. At that point, the truth becomes self-evident. Brahman is self-revealing because Brahman is the self. Yourself, myself, <laughs> everything. So this is the first point, that Brahman is to be realized and the way it is realized is through the repetition of sadhana. And then what is that realization? That will be covered in the next Adhikarana, Adhikarana 3. 
So stay tuned. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum. Aum Namah Shivaya.